Go ahead and open up your Bibles to Exodus chapter 33. Exodus chapter 33. If you don't have a Bible with you and would like to see a copy of God's Word, then we have a couple guys that are happy to pass out Bibles. Just raise your hand. They can get you a copy of God's infallible, inerrant, clear, sufficient Word. This is the time during our service when we partake of what we call communion or the Lord's Supper, the Lord's Table. And regarding this time, Jesus tells us that the purpose that it serves is to remember him and proclaim his death until he comes. To remember him and proclaim his death until he, t- he comes. One of my personal favorite ways to remember Christ is to actually go back to the Old Testament. Do you remember Jesus' words in John chapter 5? He said, if you believed Moses, then you would believe me because he wrote about me. And in Exodus chapter 33, this is one of those sections where Moses wrote about Jesus Christ, the God-man. We're going to just read from verses, uh, or from starting at verse 30, in chapter 33, verse 18, and just read on through the same context into chapter 34, and we're going to see two things that are going to aid us in our remembrance of Christ. We're going to see the deity of Jesus and the character of Jesus. Those two simple truths are gloriously illuminated for us in in this section of Scripture. So starting in Exodus 33, verse 18, Moses, interceding for the people, seeking an assurance of God's mercy to not destroy the people, but to bring his presence into their midst, he makes this request in verse 18, Then Moses said, I pray you, show me your glory. And he, this is Yahweh, the Lord, the God of the Old Testament, he said, I myself will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of Yahweh before you, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show compassion on whom I will show compassion. Verse 20, but he said, you, speaking to Moses, cannot see my face, for no man can see me and live. Then Yahweh said, behold, there is a place by me, and you shall stand there on the rock, and it will come about while my glory is passing by, that I will put you in the cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Notice in verse 19, Yahweh said, I myself will make all my goodness pass before you. And in verse 22, it is his glory that he says will be passing by. What is good about God is his glory. God's goodness is his glory. And he just provides a description of the setting that is soon to follow in his interaction with the prophet Moses. He says when he has situated Moses in this small space in the rock, Moses, as he is peering out, according to verse 22, will be able to see out but the space through which he can see will be covered with Yahweh's hand until he has passed by. And verse 23 says, Then I will remove my hand, and you will see my back, but my face shall not be seen. Moses cannot see his, ver- his face, according to verse 20 and 23. But this hand that Yahweh possesses will cover the space through which Moses can look out, and Moses, when, he, when Yahweh finally removes his hand as he is passing by, Moses will only be able to see his back 
a hand, a face, a back. This is a body. God himself describing for Moses as he displays his glory, all of his goodness in a moment will be in bodily form, but Moses will not behold the entirety of the man, the God man, but merely his back. This is an amazing reminder of Christ for us this morning, because when we remember Jesus of Nazareth, we are remembering the final form that God himself took. He still dwells in bodily form, currently seated at the right hand of the Father. And although we remember that final form that he took, it was not the first Fast forward to verse 5 of chapter 34. This God does what he described. Chapter 34 of Exodus, verse 5. Then Yahweh descended in the cloud and stood there with him, Moses. And he called upon or called out the name of Yahweh. Then Yahweh passed by in front of him and called out this. Yahweh, Yahweh God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin, yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations." This is who God is. This is who Jesus is. As God passed by Moses, doing what he previously described in the verses we just read, he makes known his own name. God's glory, God's goodness, God's name are all one. This is who he is. He is Yahweh. He is a God who is compassionate or merciful. He is a God who loves to withhold the punishment that sinners deserve because he pities them. This was glorious, gloriously displayed in Christ on the cross. God was choosing as Christ was dying on the cross to withhold judgment that sinners deserve. He is not only compassionate, but he is also gracious, meaning he gives to sinners what they do not deserve. In Christ's dying moments, while God was withholding judgment from sinners, he was also granting them, even securing, Hebrews says, an eternal redemption that they did not deserve. Because he is gracious. And he is not only compassionate and gracious, but he is also slow to anger. He is slow to anger. He endures sinners' rebellion against him for far longer than they deserve, withholding the unleashing of his wrath so that he can demonstrate his own patience towards sinners. Was this not what Jesus was doing on the cross? Was this not what God was doing when he overlooked many, many sins and generations prior, withholding the judgment that they deserved, the consequences of those sins that they deserved, waiting for an opportune time, the right time when Christ would finally come to unleash that judgment, that fury against his son, So that the sins of people like Adam and Noah and Abraham and Moses and David and Solomon and the prophets would not be unleashed against them, but unleashed in a moment, in a matter of hours against Jesus on the cross, proving that God is slow to anger. He is also these things. He is abounding in loving kindness and truth or steadfast love and faithfulness. These twin attributes 
describe God's eagerness to lavish kindness on sinners because it is consistent with his character. When God lavishes kindness on sinners, he is not doing something out of step with who he is. He abounds in this. He abounds in this kind of faithfulness, constancy of character. He always does who he is. And so he lavishes sinners with grace and kindness, bringing about the pardon that he has promised, even promised himself in eternity path, past to display to certain sinners. Verse 7 says that he keeps this display, this lavish, generous display of kindness, loving kindness for thousands. He forgives not only iniquity, but also transgression, not only iniquity and transgression, but also sin. Anything that fits within those descriptions, those categories of iniquity, transgression, and sin, God is a God who is eager to pardon them. So this morning, as you think of your own life, your own iniquities, your own transgressions, your own sins, recall that Jesus is eager to forgive those wrongdoings. And if you, up to this point in your life, have refused to submit yourself to Jesus as Lord, then this is good news for you. There's no better news than this. Obtaining some sort of temporal blessed life obtaining ambitions and dreams here on earth that might sound like good news. It doesn't compare to this good news to have your sins pardoned for an eternity when all that you deserve from God is an eternity under his just wrath and judgment toward you, a forever unending moments of nothing but heaps and heaps of God's unrelenting anger toward you, for your offenses toward him done in this lifetime, that is what we all deserve. And yet here we read that this same God who punishes sinners is a God who is eager to forgive all kinds of wrongdoing against him. Believe Jesus. Embrace him as Lord. Know the forgiveness that God is so eager to extend. Those of us who have believed in Jesus, who trust in Christ alone for salvation, this is what we ought to rejoice in in the following moments as we eat a piece of cracker and drink juice, not particularly tasty, either of them. But the realities which they symbolize are wonderful to us. This God we should not miss the end of verse 7 is also a God of justice. He will by no means, not at all, by any stretch of the imagination, leave unpunished. The phrase the guilty is inserted for smoothness of translation, but the point is that he will not leave iniquity, transgression, and sins unpunished. So either your wrongdoing against God has forever been done away with and punished in Jesus on the cross, or you one day will experience the punishment that you deserve for your sins. You will be punished for them forever in hell. Those are the only two options. All of humanity has fit into one of those categories. Sins punished on Jesus or sins endured, judgment endured for those sins on the sinner. Notice in verse 8, the only proper response to this declaration, this reminder of Jesus' character is what Moses does. Moses made haste. Moses did not delay, but he made haste to bow low toward the earth and worship. 
worship is the proper response to this declaration of God's character. And this morning, as we take communion, those of us who believe have an opportunity to ascribe worth to God. Do not ascribe merit to your own ability to repent. Do not ascribe merit to your own preparedness for this moment. In this moment, only ascribe worth to the character of God and find your hope and security and comfort and encouragement in this description of who God is. Consider that as you take communion on your own, remember who Jesus is if you believe him. And those of you who have yet to submit to Jesus as Lord, when the bread and juice come by, don't take, just pass the plate. There's no shame in that. But do take these moments to consider what we just read and maybe for the first time believe them and seek refuge in the character of God. And if you have any questions about any of these things, I would love to talk to you after the service. Men, please come forward and serve us and I'll be back and, and we'll pray.